Now, the Rohingya crisis continues to spiral. Latest reports say that more than 400,000 Rohingya refugees have fled to Bangladesh. Satellite pictures have confirmed that their villages continue to burn and the death toll goes steadily up. President Trump and I also call on this Security Council and the United Nations to take strong and swift action to bring this crisis to an end and give hope and help to the Rohingya people in their hour of need. But for all that uh, the scant evidence, the world is prepared to get tough with Myanmar. The preference, it seems, is for a diplomatic approach. And while we welcome Suu Kyi's comments that returning refugees have nothing to fear, the United States renews our call on Burma's security forces to end their violence immediately and support diplomatic efforts for a long-term solution. In fact, the 15-member UN Security Council has met twice behind closed doors to discuss the crisis. Last week, they issued an informal statement calling on the Myanmar military to seize its operations in Rakhine State. The concern is that this could trigger a sectarian or religious conflict on the lines of what is going on in West Asia, which could also see Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State gain a foothold. But there is no stomach for anything beyond platitudes, it seems, and Security Council resolution on Myanmar could be vetoed by Russia or China. Bangladesh, the country hit hardest by the crisis, has nowhere to turn to. Its helplessness exemplified by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's comments at the United Nations. Well, she, uh, her whole life fought for democracy now. You know that in Myanmar, the democracy is very nascent democracy. Very nascent, uh, just democratic system they introduced, but still the military has their power. So I don't know how much she can do or how much she can act. But she should agree that these people belong to her country. And Myanmar is their country, so they should take them back. There's little evidence that international sentiment is touching hearts where it should. The Myanmar military chief did make some conciliatory noises during a visit uh, to Rakhine earlier this week. <laughs> His remarks did not give the impression uh, that he included the Rohingya among the ethnic minorities of Myanmar. In fact, he held out a flinty warning. In India, which is already home to an estimated 40,000 Rohingya refugees, Myanmar is seen as the linchpin of the Act East policy. Also, Myanmar's cooperation is seen as key to controlling the activities of several anti-India insurgent groups. Then there's the need to ensure China's influence in that country is kept in check. Therefore, Myanmar must be kept in good humor. And while the Rohingya refugees in India are not in imminent danger of being thrown out, nobody will take them, certainly not Myanmar. The government is clear about their lack of status here. Myanmar se Bharat ghusaye, ye Rohingya refugee nahi hai, is sachai ko hume samajna chahiye. Refugee status prapt karne ke liye ek process hota hai. और इनमें से किसी ने उस प्रोसीजर को अपनाया नहीं है उस प्रोसीजर का पालन नहीं किया है रोहिंग्या लोगों को भारत से डिपोर्ट करके भारत किसी इंटरनेशनल लॉ का भी उल्लंघन नहीं करेगा क्योंकि वह 1951 के यूएन रिफ्यूजी कन्वेंशन का सिग्नेटरी भी नहीं है Joining us this evening, uh, Ray Locker, National Security Editor at USA Today from Washington, and Sushant Sarin, Senior Fellow at the Vivekananda International Foundation from New Delhi. Good evening to both of you. Sushant, to you first. While the world is talking about it, do you see the lack of direction and political will uh, to resolve this crisis, this situation? Well, I can understand uh, the reasons for that because I think uh, all the major powers, whether it's the US, whether it's India, whether it's China, 
uh, everybody is doing a bit of a diplomatic dance because everybody is trying to woo uh, Myanmar, uh, and everybody has interests in Myanmar. So that is one uh, clear factor which would prevent uh, any precipitate action against the government of Myanmar. Uh, from India's point of view, again, uh, I think uh, the lack of political will could also be reflected in the fact that can we uh, start deporting these fellows? Uh, because uh, frankly, no country can tell us. Uh, that we should keep uh, 40,000 or whatever the number is uh, of illegal immigrants. Uh, no country keeps them. Every country deports them. So if India has decided to do the same uh, for reasons of national security, then I don't think anybody can really uh, hold an issue against us on that particular score. Uh, after all, the Americans are deporting the Mexicans and everybody is deporting everybody else. So uh, I think if India does the same, the only problem is that where do we deport them to? Uh, because uh, if the Myanmar government does not accept them, uh, and and there's a caveat to what uh, you know Aung San Suu Kyi said, uh, that people who have the uh, have the uh, documents will accept them, but most of these fellows don't have any documents. So uh, there is going to be a bit of a predicament for us. But I think at least as far as the government is concerned, it's at least making the position clear uh, that these are people who are not going to be acceptable into India. And to the extent it is possible that we can deport them, that we will deport them. So uh, uh, I think that is where the Indian uh, matter stands. But as far as the rest of the Muslim world is concerned, uh, which is getting a major heartburn because of what is happening, I think they should open up uh, their territories and absorb some of these refugees uh, until the matter is settled uh, with the government of Myanmar. Why don't they do that? Why do they want uh, a poor country like Bangladesh uh, to take all the burden? Uh, I think everybody should step up to the plate. Anybody who's so bothered about it mm. should step up to the plate. Absolutely. And uh, that brings us to the question of the United States. Uh, Ray Locker, given uh, the, the, the government's policy on uh, immigrants and refugees, Mike Pence, we heard him speak. How does the U.S. view this crisis? Does it even care about what's happening in Myanmar? Well, it definitely cares about it. Whether it can actually do anything is a totally different matter. I mean, Vice President Pence said what he said at the UN. Obviously, he's expressing the feelings of many people here who are, you know, totally alarmed at what's happening with Myanmar, particularly with Aung San Suu Kyi, who was kind of a revered figure in the United States for years while she was being punished by the military government. Now they see her as basically affecting a genocide uh, with the Rohingya. But we're not taking them in the United States. I mean, that is definitely a non-starter. There are some here, a few thousand. But the president has been very adamant about limiting refugees from other countries, particularly Muslim countries. And there seems to be no groundswell to let those people come here, which is a shame. I mean, but where are they going to go? They basically have been stateless for their entire existence as a people. And there's no telling really what's going to happen to them. They're either going to go in Bangladesh and get some kind of refugee status, even though Bangladesh can't afford to have them there, or they're going to go back to Myanmar and somehow get treated better by the government that's not doing it right now. Sushant so Sarin, do you also think that the world isn't seeing the complete picture while, yes, there is a humanitarian crisis that needs to be dealt with and there are people who are now homeless? Not enough is being said or done about the origin of this, and India has been saying uh, from day one and has been giving, giving evidence of Pakistan's involvement, how the ISI and the Lashkar and others have been actively recruiting the Rohingya. Uh, do you think the focus needs to go there? I think that's very important because, uh, frankly, uh, the current crisis really starts from <coughs> Sorry, uh, the current crisis really starts from, uh, you know, the kind of uh, terrorist attacks which took place on the Myanmar security forces. Until then, there was uh, some sort of an uneasy peace. Uh, this problem has been long standing. But nevertheless, uh, the current crisis was not there. So I think uh, to only look at one part of the problem and not look at the other part of the problem, uh, I, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Now, uh, the Myanmar government uh, might have some reasons to claim that most of these guys uh, were people who came in from Bangladesh. Uh, they are not original residents of uh, the Rakhine state. Uh, that's their position. Uh, but the question which Ray asks is, I think, the real question, that if these are stateless people, then what do you do with them? Uh, where do you settle them? 
Uh, and my suggestion is that there are many uh, Muslim countries which uh, are feeling, you know, uh, a great affinity for this problem. Mm. Uh, so uh, if they take about uh, a couple of hundred thousand people, I don't think it should affect them. After all, it's, uh, you know, it's part of the Muslim Ummah, the Brotherhood and all of that. Uh, so why don't they put their money where their mouth is or their land where their mouth is? So I think that is uh, one possible solution. Uh, the other possible solution is that the Myanmar government with proper vetting uh, might allow some of these people to continue to stay and uh, give them whatever rights minorities, other minority, ethnic minority groups have in Bangladesh, uh, in Myanmar could be given to these people. But I think, you know, this has to be, you have to engage with the government of Myanmar rather than, you know, talking down to them. Mm. I don't think anybody is really in a mood uh, for anybody else to talk down to anybody. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, the Europeans and others uh, who have this habit of, you know, uh, being holier than thou, I think their hypocrisy has also been found out. So I don't think anybody is anymore in a position to tell somebody what they should or should not do. Absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, Ray Lokai, I want you to weigh in on what Sushant Sarin has just said. Also, uh, uh, Sheikh Hasina, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, is expected to address the United Nations General Assembly later today. Uh, what's expected uh, from, from that address? Uh, I can't really speak so much on what's expected from uh, the Bangladeshi president. Going back to the other point um, about where these people will go, the United States really does not have the moral high ground on this issue now as we're debating whether we should have a ban on immigration from six predominantly Muslim countries to the United States and whether it will be tough and tougher vetting. So here we are saying we don't want people from these countries coming to our country Whereas when we're going to tell somebody else, some other country, that they have to take the Rohingya or they have to do something about them, um, it's difficult. It's a humanitarian crisis, obviously, but it puts this government in a difficult position because of its, you know, competing threads of rhetoric on various issues. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, Ray Locker, Sushant Sarin, thanks very much. In fact, we have a report uh, from India. The Rohingya refugees in this country, of course, uncertain about their future. It's clear that India does not want them. But where does it uh, send them when nobody wants them is also a question. Beyond Nagendra Singh reports from a Rohingya camp in New Delhi. The government is up against a wall as it looks to deport around 40,000 Rohingya refugees on national security grounds. While a ruling by the Supreme Court on the issue is pending, the question is where to deport the Rohingya. Bangladesh is not an option. The only sensible solution is for the Myanmar government to step back and allow the return of the Rohingya. But it's doubtful the Rohingya would want to return. <laughs> और हम असल में इंडिया में हम एक अच्छा सा नौकरी में नहीं मिलता हम लोगों क्योंकि नहीं तो लैंग वाइज के प्रॉब्लम हो जाते नहीं तो अपना आईडी प्रूफ नहीं है हमारे पास यहां का उसके लिए ना यहां का एक अच्छा नौकरी नहीं मिलती और इसलिए हम लोगों को जो पढ़ा लगा हुआ लोग है उनको भी ऐसे हल्का काम करना पड़ते इन द रोहिंग्या कैंप इन दिल्ली चिल्ड्रन आर वोसिफरस इन वांटिंग टू स्टे ऑन इन दिल्ली Many of the Rohingya here have a decent education but cannot find jobs or people willing to employ them. Although they have refugee cards issued by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and others have Aadhaar cards. It's difficult to find work unless as daily wage laborers on construction sites. The lucky few find work helping out in shops. We are in the government. लेकिन हम लोग अगर डिपोर्ट करेगा तो कहां भेजेगी हम लोगों को या बर्मा भेजेगी या बांग्लादेश भेजेगी वो भी हम लोगों को मालूम नहीं What complicates the situation is the absence of a law regulating the treatment of refugees in India India has not signed the 1961 UN refugee convention nor the 1967 protocol 
The reasons are rooted in security. South Asia's borders are porous and any conflict anywhere in the region could result in a mass influx of displaced people who could upset the demographic balance. Domestic laws never mention refugees. The Foreigners Act of 1946 only deals with the entry and the exit of foreign nationals. It does not recognize refugees as a special category requiring protection. The process of deciding who is a refugee is also unclear. We are in one of the Rohingya refugee camps in New Delhi. There are more than 200 families living here and most of them working as daily laborers. After the government's decision to deport more than 40,000 Rohingyas living in different parts of India, they are living in constant fear of deportation. They are unsure of what the future beholds for them and what is their future in India for their children. With video journalist Ajit, Nagin Singh, we on.